If humans, regardless of particular characteristics such as race, sex, or cognitive capacities, have the right to be treated with respect, then non-human animals also have this right. That is, having the right to be treated with respect means one cannot permissibly be treated as a mere means. This view can be defended in at least two ways. First, if humans have the right to be treated with respect, then it would be irrational and arbitrary to recognize this right in humans while not also recognizing it in non-human animals of comparative and relevant capacities. Second, the properties that account for the strong moral value of humans are found in many non-human animals. This position and its supporting reasons can be found in the work of philosopher Tom Reagan. But before going further with Reagan's arguments, we'll briefly go over the consequentialist views of Jerry Bentham and Peter Singer to see how they compare to a rights-based view like Reagan's. The 18th century English philosopher Jerry Bentham noted that just as it is unreasonable to permit harming an individual based on his or her skin color, so too it must be unreasonable to permit harming an individual based on his or her number of legs or skin texture. Rather, pain is pain regardless of the superficial traits one possesses. If one experiences pain, then according to Bentham, one has direct moral standing. Here, Bentham criticized the popular position of denying non-human animals direct moral consideration. That said, he did not establish the right to be treated with respect, as it would be permissible under Bentham's utilitarianism to kill and abuse non-human animals if the action were optimistic. That is, if abusing and killing non-human animals, or human animals, produce the best consequences, then it would be permissible and obligatory to do so. Under his theory, there are no moral rights for Bentham to invoke to protect the interests of individuals, human or otherwise. On one hand, Bentham's position was radical at the time for ascribing direct moral standing to non-human animals. Yet it wasn't too radical, as Bentham still found himself defending the status quo of slaughtering and using animals. Philosopher Peter Singer, a contemporary utilitarian, has echoed Bentham's critique against what can be called speciesism. Singer is prominent for arguing that speciesism runs parallel in its arbitrariness and unfairness to that of racism, sexism, and the like. The parallel is a convincing point against speciesism, but Singer, too, does not argue for the right to be treated with respect. Instead, as a result of Singer adhering to a consequentialist theory, individuals can permissively be killed and replaced with other individuals if the consequences are either morally neutral or positive. As with Bentham, Singer is unable to invoke moral rights to protect individuals from this treatment. Now, the central claim in Singer's animal liberation a claim that Singer's case for animal liberation hinges on is that we ought to give similar interests equal consideration. Despite offering a radical view by applying the principle of equal consideration of interests to non-human animals and inferring animal liberation as a conclusion, Singer, like Bentham, ends up defending the status quo to some degree by being committed to the view that animals can be used and killed for seemingly trivial reasons, and that ultimately their value as individuals is dependent on the utility they provide or hold. Finally, we have the contemporary philosopher Tom Reagan. Reagan agrees with Singer's critique of speciesism, but he argues that Singer's account for the moral status of both humans and non-human animals is unsatisfactory. The fundamental problem is that Singer, Bentham, and company do not ascribe inherent value to individuals. Rather, consequences take moral primacy. Because of this, their theories permit the exploitation of individuals if the exploitation is optimistic. And this is a fundamental problem that plagues consequentialist theories. Reagan, however, builds a defense for animal rights by following the Kantian tradition of ascribing worth to individuals for their own sake. That said, he deviates from Immanuel Kant by extending respect to not just humans, but also to non-human animals. 
The argument for departing from Kant here is straightforward. Kant believed, as many people since have believed, that we should not treat humans as mere means. The problem, however, is that not all humans are safe under Kant's theory. For Kant, humans who exist as ends in themselves are those who are autonomous agents. Yet there are humans who are severely mentally enfeebled who do not and cannot possess the rationality to be considered autonomous. So as a consequence of Kant's theory, it would be permissible to treat those humans as mere means to our ends. Intuitively, this is an appalling conclusion, and so it needs to be resolved. A prominent solution and a source of the problem for the Kantian is to recognize the inherent value of non-autonomous humans. However, if we recognize the inherent value of these individuals, what is the reason for not recognizing it in non-human animals as well? Many non-human animals cannot reason sufficiently well enough to be considered autonomous, but as we've just established, this criterion doesn't rule out severely mentally enfeebled humans. So how could it hope to rule out non-human animals? The only answer that comes to mind is that of speciesism. But if Singer, Bentham, and company are correct in its untenability akin to racism, then this move won't do. Reagan goes on to argue for what elucidates the value possessed by autonomous humans, non-autonomous humans, and non-human animals. They are subjects of a life. As subjects of a life, they are aware of both the world and of what happens to them. What happens to them matters to them, and each life has an experiential welfare that can go well or ill, logically independent of the utility they bring us. Rather than reason accounting for the inherent value of humans, after all, it doesn't account for the value of non-autonomous humans, it's being a subject of a life, which accounts for both autonomous and non-autonomous humans. But as a result of this, and by rejecting speciesism, so too must non-human animals be considered as beings of inherent value. Meaning, just like humans, many non-human animals have the right to be treated with respect. We cannot permissibly treat them as mere means.